Welcome to Disciples Net Church. We are so glad you've joined us for worship. Feel free to join in with hymns, pray with us, and share in communion. Wherever and whenever you are joining us, God's Spirit and people from all over the world are here with you. So let's prepare our hearts for worship. In the biblical narratives of creation, God began in the dark, in soil, wombs, and resurrection morning, God duplicates the darkness as a marker of beginning. Yet pervasive in our Advent theology and practices is a desire to dismiss and overcome the darkness as if it presents a threat to our humanity or our faithfulness. That we are displaced in moments or seasons of darkness is a myth. Light is not a correction to darkness. Advent is a season to learn the sounds and rhythms of darkness. It is intended to strengthen our faith in seasons when we cannot depend on vision and light. Will you please pray with me? Oh God, in the Christmas season, it's so easy for us to meditate on the wondrous story of the birth of your Son. The angels, a glorious sight in the night sky, singing your praises. The faith of the shepherds as they made their way to the manger. The appearance of a star that would guide the wise men from the east, bearing gifts to the Christ child. What a beautiful image. We don't want to think about how poor Mary and Joseph were, or that the reason they were in Bethlehem was because of the taxes imposed by the ruthless Roman Empire that crushed division with violence and cruelty. We don't want to think about Herod's slaughter of innocent children soon to come. We don't want to think about these things in the midst of our vision of a silent night where we hear the cry of the Christ child and then imagine the comfort he finds at his mother's breast. We don't want to ruin our peaceful image of the Christmas story because the type of world you sent your son into is still here. A world that still has poverty and oppression and division and the brutality of an indiscriminate massacres. How could such a world exist, we wonder, after the promise you gave us in our Christmas image of the manger where a child met with such adoration and love? God, we thank you for Christmas. We thank you for Christmas because we need it. We need the yearly reminder of the beautiful story we behold at the manger. The silent night with a star shining bright, the angels singing praises to God, the shepherds faithfully going to Bethlehem and wise men traveling. We need this Christmas story and the promises we find at the manger, the promise of a better world, where poverty no longer exists, where oppression is no longer known, where there is unity instead of division, and where violence is a thing of the past. Oh God, despite what we see around us, help us hold on to the lovely story of Christmas not just in the Christmas season, but every day. Help us to remember it as we pray the prayer that your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, how would be our name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Amen. 
Because there are some things about this passage that are more obvious in the Greek, I will read the passage as a transliteration in order to highlight some of these things. This is Luke 1, 26-38. Yet in the sixth month, the messenger Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee which is named Nazareth, to a virgin who was betrothed to a man who is named Joseph out of the house of David. And the name of the virgin is Miriam. And coming to her, he said, Greetings, you who have been graced. The Lord is with you. Yet she was puzzled and troubled at the word and deliberated what manner of salutation this may be. And the angel said to her, Do not be fearing, Miriam, for you found grace with God. And behold, you shall conceive inside and shall produce a son and shall call his name Jesus, who shall be great and shall be called a son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give to him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob into the ages and his reign will not end. Yet Mary said to the angel, How is this to be, since I did not know and am not knowing a man? And the angel answering said to her, A holy spirit will come to you, and a power of the highest shall overshadow you. And for this reason the Holy One which is born will be called a son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for she who was called barren. For with God any word will not be impossible. Yet Mary said, Behold, the servant of the Lord, may it become in me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Come, O long expected Jesus, born to set your people free. Salvation to impart, dear desire of many a nation, joy of many a longing heart. Born your people to. With God, any word will not be impossible, says the angel. I'm thinking of a word right now that seems quite impossible. And yet, 
I wonder. That word is love, and it is our theme for this Sunday. Yet you and I can wonder if being loving is possible in a world that is so unloving. In my own country, the United States, our political systems have devolved into two factions which often seem only to be able to view the other side as evil people intent on forcing their will upon us. Or at least people who aren't very smart and are easily controlled by the truly evil people. It seems a recipe for hatred that will almost surely lead to violence against each other. And we are not alone in our divisions. A study a few years ago for the BBC indicates that 75% of the people in 27 countries across the world felt not only that their society was divided, but that it was more divided than it had been only 10 years ago. These divisions were not entirely political. Some people noted wealth divisions. Others noted divisions between immigrants and people born in the country. Some people noted religious divisions. Others noted urban versus rural divisions. They all agreed that these divisions caused tension, intolerance, and hatred between the groups. This polarization has boiled into open violence between groups in the states, Israel and Palestine, India, Pakistan, Myanmar, and Turkey, just to name a few. Around the world there are seven major wars, 14 lesser wars, 23 conflicts, and a set of 12 more skirmishes active as we come to the end of this year, resulting in over 84,000 combat deaths this year alone. And this does not take into account non-combatants who are killed as troops move through their areas. It seems as though hatred is getting worse. Is there any way to stem and reverse this tide? Is love possible in a world that is so unloving? Would it help to recognize that the world into which Jesus was born was also one fraught with conflict and divisions? The so-called Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome, was not an idyllic absence of violence. Indeed, the so-called peace was enforced by brutal violence of the Roman legions. Israel itself was divided into at least four factions, each with their own idea of how to deal with the Roman occupation, and each with no love lost on the others. You see in various places in the Gospels representatives from each of these groups coming to Jesus to ask tricky questions. It's clear that they weren't so much interested in the answer as they were interested in using the popular rabbi against those other factions. So how could one whom John described as the living embodiment of God's love for the world bring love into such a world as that? Into such a world as ours? The first key is to recognize that love is not some tenuous feeling for something abstract. It reminds me of a well-known Peanuts comic by Charles Schultz, where Linus says, I love mankind. It's people I can't stand. That's the problem. It is easy to love all human beings in principle but to fail to love specific human beings. In the same way that God loves each and every one of us, we must love not only universally, but specifically. We must also remember that love comes with a cost. To love someone, to truly desire what is best for them, is to open yourself up to disappointment and heartbreak. Not only might someone you love not love you back. But you may love someone who takes your love for granted, 
or even takes advantage of it. God was willing to risk being rejected and taken for granted in order to show us that God loves us. One time, when God wanted us to know how it felt, he had a prophet named Hosea marry an unfaithful prostitute. From his own experiences, Hosea could tell us how it felt to love and be rejected, how it felt to be taken for granted, and still act in love. God in Jesus was vulnerable. And it was all to show us how much God loves us. God in Jesus was also specific. Jesus didn't simply teach us to love our neighbor, all our neighbors, but Jesus reached out in love to outcast lepers, to the forgotten Syrophoenician woman, to blind Barnabas, to me, and to you. And so must we reach out in love not to the world in some vague way, but to each one we meet along the way, to those that are hard to love, to those who reject us, to each specific one that is our brother or sister, another beloved child of God. This is how God, through Jesus, can bring love into this unloving world, through my hands and my voice through your hands and your voice, through our actions for and with the ones we encounter. What would our world look like if even a fraction of us truly loved each person we met? With God, any word will not be impossible, even, especially, love. The Incarnation says many things, but the one thing it says most clearly, most consistently, always and ever, is love. God's love for each and every one of us. God's love that knows no boundaries and no limitations. God's love that can be our love as well. For many Christians, and rightfully so, the cross is the focal point of faith. In the cross, God shows us that nothing is too much and nothing will keep God from showing God's love from us. Yet, in the Incarnation, love speaks just as clearly. It is as Calvin Miller said, there are two words of such great significance that they have been heard around the world. The first is a cry of a baby saying, it has begun. The second is a cry of a man saying, it is finished. But these are really not two words at all. They're one and the same word, and that word is love. May we say with Mary, may it become in me as you have said. May we live out this love in our words and our deeds. Amen. Hope is a star that shines in the night, leading us on till the morning is bright. When God is a child, there's joy in our song. The last shall be first, and the weak shall be strong, and none shall be afraid. Joy is a song that welcomes the dawn, telling the world that the Savior is born. When God is a child, there's joy in our song. The last shall be first, and the weak shall be strong, and none shall be afraid. Love is a flame that burns in our heart. Jesus has come and will never depart. When 
God is a child, there's joy in our song. The last shall be first, and the weak shall be strong, and none shall be afraid. I'd like to thank Dean Phelps for bringing our word today and for the reminders of the choices that we have to make. And we choose to come now to this table. The table is set with bread and cup. And although it's true that we here at Disciples Net can't actually provide the actual bread and the cup to you, it's similar to the ways that Jesus sets a table here, that the disciples prepare the bread and the cup, but Jesus would give them meaning. And the meaning of this table is that it is a place to remember God's love for the world, to share that love with one another, to take it into our bodies, and then to go out. And friends, this week has been one that's seen terrible, horrible destruction at the hands of another human being in places like Pakistan and Australia. And we've grieved and wept as we've heard terrible stories, not just there but around the world, of what vengeance and hatred can do. This table is an alternative to that. This table is one where we may come in grief and feeling that there is no peace on earth. As Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote in his poem on Christmas Day, 1863, during the Civil War in America, he just learned that his oldest son, Charles, age 19, had been wounded severely in the war, that Henry Longfellow had fought so hard to keep from happening because he thought people could find a way to get along. And Longfellow was still in grief over the tragic death of his wife in an accident two years before. And he wrote, and in despair, he bowed his head. There is no peace on earth, he said, for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. But in the next lines, Longfellow seems to remember, reminds us God is not dead, nor does he sleep. And as we come to this table, we also remember that love is more powerful than hate, and love will prevail. And we are called, once again, to remember the message that Christ has given us this day, and take that out into the world. So as we come, won't you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we thank you for the bread and the cup that's before each person that's listening now, whether it's physical and before them, or it's held in their mind's eye. We ask that you bless this bread and the cup as it's taken now into our lives and out into the world. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. For it was on that last night as Jesus was eating with his disciples that he gave this reminder by taking a loaf of bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said to them, Take and eat, this is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after they had finished eating, he took a cup. And said to them, This cup is the new covenant, and my blood poured out for you. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you tell the Lord's story, you tell the Lord's life and death until he comes again. The table is set, my friends. Won't you come and won't you share? The body of Christ broken for you. The cup of blessing poured out for you.
friends, we have heard the good news. It's God's love is not limited. That love is not impossible for God. So, let us go into our world speaking love, and more importantly, doing love for those around us. Let us become that word of love for all those who cry out, longing for love in this loveless world. May it become in us according to the word. And may that word be love. Amen.